my honor and privilege to introduce Mafalda Duarte, the Executive Director of Green Climate Fund. Uh, we have with us Sadhguru, who is on a three-year decade-old mission to save soil and create a conscious planet. Um, given that both of you have sustainable agriculture and food systems close to your heart, uh, maybe I'll start kick off with a question for both of you. Um, what should be our global priorities right now, given the current environment? Namaskaram to all of you. And uh, <clears throat> well, uh, every prior, every aspect of life is important. Different people are focusing on different priorities right now. Fossil fuels has been the biggest priority. Well, it is, not questioning it. But if you want to shift away from fossil fuels, you need technological innovations and breakthroughs. Without that, no significant shift will happen. Things have been happening reasonably, but when it comes to technological in innovations, whether it'll come in three months or three decades, you don't know. You're investing in something which may happen or may not happen. But over five billion hectares of land, is agricultural land, where human hands are tending to it. Where human hands on a daily basis are tending to the land, if we cannot change that, which could account for mitigating thirty-seven percent of the climate issues, and we don't do anything about that and go on talking about catching the carbon dioxide in the air, well, we will we'll be not so wise about how we are investing our money and our resources and our energies in that direction. Because that part of the world where human hands are on a daily basis attending to it, that should be the first thing to change. And above all, over sixty to sixty-four percent of the world's population is involved in agriculture. And this is generally the poorest class of people, most improvised part of the society. If climate action and climate action funding do not go in their direction, and it is going to a small strata of technology-based people, I think it's a very unfair distribution of things. But it's fortunate that in this COP28, for the first time, there is an agriculture declaration, both by the government parties and also the non-government parties also have come, come up with that, making soil a significant part. Soil, agriculture, farmers are important because whether next generation will eat well or not will depend on that, whether the source of life, which is soil, whether you are a human being or a tree or a bird or an animal or a worm or an insect, the basis is soil. So if we take away the fundamental source of life, then what are we doing? And that is depleting at a pace that you can't imagine. It is depleting at a tremendous pace. According to FAO, twenty-seven thousand species are going extinct per year. So at this pace, in another twenty-five to forty years' time, we'll have difficulty growing food on this land, anywhere in the world. And microbiome is not just about soil, our bodies are over sixty percent microbiome, everything that is life is that. We must understand microbial life is the foundational life, and the foundation for that life is soil. It's an honor to be here with you, Sadhguru, uh, and I know your audience online will be much larger than the one here <laughs> Uh, it's a pleasure to be with uh, with all of you. Um, the priorities you asked, so what should be the priorities? Uh, I agree with Sadhguru that uh, there are so many priorities. Um, the one thing is clear, uh, and Sadhguru speaks about it and just reflected on some of it. If we don't pay attention to um, what we are doing to land and soil, with an increasing population that we have, with um, the land degradation, with the loss of soil that we are observing globally, uh, already now we are concerned with food security. We have 250 million people uh, suffering from severe hunger. Uh, we just we can just imagine uh, what that can look like with these trends. Um, so, and, and then we have climate change, and climate change is aggravating that. This, this was already, this loss of soil and the loss of, and the degradation of land is something that is happening for 
quite some time, for a long time. Um, but now, with, with the impacts of climate, this is just being uh, exacerbated. Um, so, climate is exacerbating fragility. Um, so, of course, you know, we are here in the COP and I'm, I, I, it, it's, it's good to see the spotlight on, on a number of things that have been a little bit neglected. Uh, soil, agriculture, one of them, health, another one, uh, conflict. Even this morning I was in, a, in, a, in an event on fragility and, and conflict. Um, one thing is, is in, in, and as I came to this COP, um, one of the things that really concerns me uh, is the science is telling us that actually our window of doing something about climate is narrowing. Uh, very rapidly because you know the more the scientists keep researching and 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 investigating they are now saying that we will reach 1.5 this decade not the next decade mm -hmm. uh, and we will stay there and and uh, and if we don't really revert uh, our practices and and the way we are investing the way we are producing and consuming um, we, we, we are placing ourselves in a trajectory that uh, we don't know. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, what, what has been happening just recently with the pandemic and the war in Ukraine and now in uh, Israel and, uh, and uh, Palestine, uh, you know, all of these shocks that come one after the other, um, compo compounding shocks, um, they are going to become... I'm not saying that we will have more and more wars or pandemics. The likelihood of more pandemics, the, the scientists also say it's there. Uh, but we are just not equipped, in my view, as societies to deal with all of these frequent shocks coming and coming and coming. And that's what overlaying on what's already happening. If we don't really act and act with ambition and and decisiveness um, we are in a very dangerous trajectory as as human beings um, so uh, we need these events to really deliver uh, and the political the, the here we have politicians we have private sector entities we we need them to be the leaders that we that are required for the times we are in both on uh, mitigating emissions and on adaptation uh, uh, and and the, the good thing about soil is that it it can achieve both um, it, it's a beautiful nexus some it, even in our experience we don't have necessarily funding that is soil with the explicit uh, and direct intent of, of soil but when we talk about our investments in forestry or in ecosystems or in agriculture uh, and 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 we think about food security and we think about livelihoods. Inevitably, we have to deal with soil. <clears throat> One aspect is when we talk about any kind of vegetation, we always talking about building back forests. But with the population pressures we have, particularly in tropical nations, building back forests is going to be just talk. We can never do that because. You can't reclaim agricultural land and convert into forest because, for example, in India, we have 17.2% 17, 17.2% of the world's population and only 4% of the land. You're not going to tell people, we're going to make forest out of your village. This is never going to work. So what we have done is to do what is called as tree-based agriculture, to bring trees back. Why is this important? One thing is for the soil in general, but why is the organic content or organisms in the soil is going down, which is the foundational life for all of us, is they don't have food to eat. We're talking about starvation for 250 million people. Many, many trillions of organisms are being starved to death right now, which are micro, which we cannot see, but which is the basis of life. So, how can we feed them? The only way we can feed them is we have to produce organic content on the farm itself. The moment you talk about transporting it from somewhere, it becomes an expensive and an impractical solution. So there has to be trees which produce green manure 
and there has to be animals on the land. So, in, we are pushing the Indian government to give incentives to have animals on the farm and we have systems with which two bovine animals per acre of land can make a significant difference for that land with a few trees and two bovine animals. Right now we are seeing excessive number of bovine animals as a problem. That is, you know, it's become an election issue, people are asking what to do with the extra animals. I said, where are the extra animals? In a... in a nation where nearly sixty-five percent of the population is involved in agriculture, where is there something called as an extra animal? There is no extra animal, there is no extra piece of dung, there is no extra leaf. Everything is not enough for land to regenerate. Every extra green leaf that we put on the land is climate mitigation for the planet. Picking on... Picking on the sense of urgency <clears throat> that you both brought up, you from the climate perspective and your point about hunger and other urgent issues, I think maybe it's because of that that in the last few years we've seen finally a bit of more attention to sustainable agriculture. More scientific studies are saying and validating what and intuitively people like you have been talking about for a long time, which is like soil organisms are the best predictor of not just the eels but also drought resistance in most of the communities. And finally, climate specialists are coming around to saying that we need to use every tool in our arsenal which is getting attention to sustainable agriculture. And I think that's the positive side. But all these theories that are bubbling up, from your perspectives, what would it take to make them into reality on the ground? See, to make it a reality, we need to make a farmer-based uh, policy. Right now, academics are forming policies. I'm sorry, I have nothing against them. They are good to do research, they are give good to provide information, but they cannot implement a solution, all right? Neither the scientists nor academics can actually put it on the ground, it's only the farmer. So unless the policies are single-pointed, simple and implementable, Right now, I've been talking to the European Union and stuff, they've come out with the soil thing, which you need a PhD to understand, all right? This is not going to become a reality just like that, it's too complex. It needs to be one-pointed, incentive-based for the farmer that he can do on the land. You say something where so elaborate, I'm not saying it's not true, what they're saying is fantastic, but Implementation won't happen. People will write theses on it and earn doctorates, and people will earn, uh, uh, you know, rewards and awards. But action has to happen means it's the farmer who has to implement. Right now, farmer's economy across the world, for all limited, medium and, limited, you know, small-scale farmers, their economy is so fragile, small aberrations, it'll collapse. On an average, this is an unfortunate statistic, very... with pain I'm saying this. On an average, every day, twenty-eight farmers in India are committing suicide. Every hour, more than one farmer is committing suicide. This is mainly because land is not rich. If the land was rich, why would he commit suicide? And also the migration that's happening. In India, it's estimated by 2032, 220 million people will migrate from rural to urban areas. You're from India, tell me which city is equipped to handle 220 million people. Across the world, it's estimated 1.1 to 1.2 billion people will migrate. If their land was rich and if there was living wealth on the land in the form of trees and other things, who would leave the land? And I'm going to speak, I think, to something that uh, is a mission of uh, Sadhguru and the Isha Foundation, which is raising awareness and consciousness. Uh, and um, I think um, there's a very small percentage of probably of the farmers that understand what it actually... because probably they are adopting practices that they have been adopting for a long time and they might not really understand what those practices are doing uh, to the soil. Um, so on the one hand, of course, we have to work with, uh, with the, the governments, um, and th this, this is what you have been doing, and, and all that trip that you did over Europe and Middle East uh, uh, 
that generated commitments from several governments and you and you continue to do it so it's important uh, to work with with uh, with the governments um, it's equally important to keep working with the governments after they put policies in place because you know we have quite a lot of policies mm -hmm. but that are then not implemented um, and really understanding a country by country basis what are the mechanisms that might exist or not exist to reach the farmers because we are talking about uh, smallholder uh, farmers um, so uh, you know it's interesting I, I was um, I was one time in um, uh, Ghana visiting um, cocoa um, I, I was visiting communities local communities and um, their ancestral practices uh, were, they had forgotten about it, but the ancestral practices were to plant cocoa and the trees. So, but then suddenly at some point in their trajectory, uh, and the lady here is waving, maybe she knows as well, um, they imported some practices from Ivory Coast, which was love, love, uh, Love it is it. It was. I, they have an expression, but it's like cocoa loves sun, and it's really not the reality. Um, so, getting these communities, but there was a whole movement around, you know, bringing back those ancestral practices and knowledge, which at some point in the trajectory had been abandoned. Um, so, right now, you know, my question is: Do most of these smallhold farmers in the world? understand that you know use of uh, pesticides um, and as a matter of fact it's it's it is depleting this um, biodiversity um, do they understand that you know monocultures are really not um, conducive to forming this richness in soil um, do they understand that soil compaction actually prevents water absorption uh, in soil? So we we really need to find the and it's not you know in India it might be one way in other countries it will be other ways, uh, but we need this commitment and uh, and 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 really being focused on working with governments and whatever the communities uh, harnessing the knowledge of the indigenous people that have been there and and really having a different relationship to nature than what we uh, in uh, in what call we called developed more developed contexts <laughs> that's uh, a very big thing to ask for <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think uh, yeah, I, 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 I think it's it's not a one size fits all, but um, but we need to reach the, the the small farmers, and and we really need to work with the with the, with the local communities and the indigenous people. Because, ma'am, you mentioned uh, soil compaction is not the way to handle things, which is one hundred percent. So. Uh, imitating a few Western nations which had large tracts of land and not enough people to farm, they came up with massive machines to do this. A time has come where we must, because we are talking about, because technology companies need to be invested in, instead of simply thinking of alternative fuels, which also must happen, I'm not against that, but we must invest in producing small-scale agricultural machines and also AI machines where fertilizer and pesticide can be applied in a doctored manner. Like as we are doing to human beings, if a particular vitamin is not there in you, we take it for a little bit of time. Just like that, right now the mass application of chemicals is the problem. This is not about becoming philosophical or fanatical about this kind of farming or that kind of farming. Because farming is a pragmatic activity, it can't be addressed like some religion or philosophy. So if chemical is needed, it can go, but it can go to the extent that is needed and where it should go. Right now there is no such measure. I feel chemical consumption, agricultural chemical consumption, if we do it the right way, can be brought down to ten percent of what it is. At ten percent of what we are using right now, we won't cause much damage. If you en enhance the organic content, 
and using ten percent of that where it is needed, it will make a huge difference. Technology investment should go into manufacturing. Small machines, if you leave them, they should be working through the day and human beings are not needed. They will go by themselves and apply where it is necessary. This is not difficult, we have all the technology. The innovation of making those machines need to happen. And I think the farmers are ready to switch because I think fertilizers and pesticides, they're all petrochemical based, they expose them more to factors outside their control which is the price of oil. So from that perspective, they're looking for alternatives, maybe biological inputs. Um, it, but it lit up <laughs> listening to you. <laughs> um, but staying with the topic of smallholder farmers, um, there are about 600 million smallholder farmers who are farming on less than two hectares of land. And in most of the global south, over 50% of the farmers are marginal farmers, which means they have less than a hectare of land. And um, my favorite statistic is that in some countries, okay, I'm being cynical about it, is that almost 90% of the subsidies goes to the big ag, to your point. Um, but we hold the smallholder farmers more accountable, we want them to do more um, and we want them to do it the right way. But um, for that, some of them are willing, but it's a big push to put on them to say, you have to think about the long-term soil health and long-term measures that will make a meaningful impact. Um, uh, climate finance could be a solution. Um, because in some instances, the governments can step in and provide that financing. But in some instances, that's not a possibility. But do you foresee climate finance stepping in and solving some of the problems here? Um, and what are the opportunities and challenges that you foresee? Can Did I you want to go first? Whichever way. Go ahead. See, uh, this is a, a very fundamental problem with farming in tropical lands. Let me talk about India because I, I know it firsthand, not by stats. So average land holding is less than a hectare for a family, for a family. There is no way they can ever make farming into a lucrative process with less than a hectare for five to six people who are in the family. For every hectare of land, there is a barbed wire fence, there is a bore well, there is a power connection and there is an operational E equipment and everything for every hectare of land. This is a criminal waste of all resources. So as a part of this, right now we are running twenty-five farmer producer organizations. There are over five thousand farmer producer organizations in the country registered, but only a few are functional. Our twenty-five are active. One of our farmer producer organizations, which is six years old, has won national and state awards as the best performing thing. What have we done? It's very simple. We have not aggregated the land because unfortunately still we don't have contiguous land. They are all in different places. But we have aggregated the produce, marketing and sourcing of material. We just opened a superstore where on all the agricultural inputs, thirty percent or more used to be dealer percentage. That's going straight to the farmer. And uh, farmers are going to the land every day one reason is, every day he has to go and prove this is my land. Though they have owned it for many generations, every day he used to go, otherwise somebody may move the marking stones. So one thing is we digitally mapped the lands and said, there is no question of changing the, uh, you know, the survey stones cannot be moved, it's digitally marked and fixed. So this needs to happen across the world, that your land should be marked digitally and nobody on land should be able to change it because of whatever prejudices they have. And the next thing is, most farmers go sit there because they have to watch out, otherwise somebody's cattle may come and eat up their crop or they have to turn on the electric pump. Once we made these farmer producer organizations, these activities are taken care of in a different way, in a more consolidated way. Once that is done, what you see is, if you do this for the whole country, for example, India, you will be releasing five hundred to six hundred million hands from unnecessary work. They could focus this time, energy, resource on something else, an economic activity that they can do on the side, either in terms of arts, crafts or enhancing the produce in so many different ways, value addition to the produce that they have. This could be a revolution. Right now, we are doing twenty-five uh, uh, farmer-producer organizations, but our problem is this is not contiguous land, 
different farmers in different places. But still I would say, at least for forty percent of the farmers, their incomes have gone up over fourfold, four hundred percent. For the remaining sixty percent, at least double has definitely happened for all of them. So this is just a matter of four to six years' time. And we have not done any great amount of work, we just consolidated the marketing and the procurement of inputs and certain level of advice as to how they should do these things. Their lives have changed dramatically. But it happens in contiguous land means we can change everything. But the problem means uh, they belong to different religions, different castes. My uncle, my grand uncle fought with your, your great grand uh, aunt or whatever some nonsense is there, old feuds. They will not cross this unless there is a financial thing. So right now I'm trying to create, I know this is not the right term, but I'm using this term intentionally. I'm calling this honey money. We put honey money in the center and say, we put, let's say, two hundred and fifty crores, which must be around thirty-five, thirty-six million dollars, put it in the center, no one rupee will not go to the farmer. But if you put this and say, we will put this here, if ten thousand farmers with contiguous land come together, beyond your religion, caste, creed, keep those things aside and come together, if you come together, this thirty-five, thirty-six million dollars are available to you, not as cash but in terms of infrastructure, advice, facilitation, in five years duration, we can multiply their income significantly, we can change the soil composition, we have proved that water tables have come up significantly in the areas where we have worked right now, we have transformed over two hundred thousand farmers like this. But that is still a drop in the ocean, because just in the Kaveri Basin where we are working, which is a river basin, there are 5.2 million farmers. So I'm saying the scale of activity is so big, but creating a few large-scale modules where it's working wonderfully is the only way to infect others, to pick it up by themselves and do it. Subsidies. <laughs> Not subsidy. No, 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 I, I, I'm picking on her… Okay. on her introductory point on uh, uh, subsidies. We are full of uh, uh, subsidies that… Uh, uh, you know, we, we can think of, of course, fossil fuel subsidies we talk about all the time, trillions and trillions, that actually incentivize something that we know uh, is not to our benefit. Uh, we have uh, water subsidies as well that uh, drive uh, excess consumption of uh, water. Then we have other subsidies that... So we are, yeah, agricultural subsidies are full of... So that's, that's something for very interesting for governments to... Um, to really uh, take a look, uh, and there's a lot of work, and you know, and several organizations they keep talking about this. Um, but it's coming to 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 this point of climate finance. Um, climate finance certainly can support this um, because it's at the core of when we talk about the resilience to the climate change impacts. Um, you know, actually helping these farmers, to, these, these tend to be the most vulnerable uh, communities and um, so actually, you know, helping them, this, this is at the core of the resilience. And here a big call for doubling the amount of resources that are actually going to adaptation and to the most vulnerable. And, and then the question is the mechanisms. It could be state-led mechanisms, incentives by the national government or the local governments, but also we have seen, not necessarily for, for, for soil, but uh, we have seen even the national financial institutions, uh, either public or private, that, um, you know, using uh, climate finance, they themselves, they educate themselves about which uh, type of financing they should be providing to farmers. They, are hel they help the farmers uh, understand that, you know, different practices is, are to their benefit and then what we we don't we provide a subsidy so that the lines of credit are affordable enough for the farmers um, to to take on this this uh, these loans and and invest uh, in different practices in within their farmland so again there are I'm sure that you know in different countries there will be uh, this is this what Sadhguru is reflecting you know, response to the reality of India and even parts of India. 
I, I don't know your country, so <laughs> <laughs> No, it uh, reflects the reality of the, almost the entire nation and I would say entire tropical lands on the planet. Right now, the governments of Suriname and Guyana are offering us twenty-five to fifty thousand acres of parcels. They're saying, please demonstrate this, what you have demonstrated in southern India, so that our farmers can take up. So we're trying to set up research and educational institutions along with the farming. So the important thing is, as we mentioned in the beginning, it's a lack of scale which makes it so difficult. And we are also in these nations moving from subsistence farming to commercial farming. Subsistence farming, when it was there, they grew everything that they needed in those few acres that they had. They didn't have money. I have clearly witnessed this as I'm growing up. When I went to villages, people were in rags, there was no clean water, all this, but people were sturdy. Today, there is enough food, people are eating, and they're wearing better clothes, they're all riding motorcycles or whatever else, other… many of them have cars and tractors. Of course, everybody has a cell phone, there are uh, Wi-Fi kiosks in the villages, but sixty percent of the rural population in India, you must see this. Unfortunately, nobody seems to have eyes to see this. Sixty percent of the rural population, the male population is like this. Their very skeletal system has not grown. We are producing a whole underdeveloped population. This is a silent disaster, it doesn't make noise. If the men are like this, the women's condition is always worse because that is the nature of a social structure. And uh, you can understand what kind of children they will produce tomorrow. So we are producing an underdeveloped population. In next thirty, forty years' time, you will see this India is right now very proud of its intellectual prowess and all this. You will see a significant drop if you don't fix this now, the nourishment values. People are eating, but there is not enough nourishment. People are having things to spend around, they're in the marketplace, they're in the cinema, they're in the malls, much more than ever the rural people, but their skeletal system is like this, men have not grown full… full size. If your body doesn't grow to full size, I believe even your brain doesn't grow to full size. One of the points you brought up was around um, the ability um, and you, um, Sadhguru, um, amplified that with the honey pot that you're setting because one of the big issues is just not just scale but the ability to make sure that the farmers understand what is the yes. nature of financing that's available. So, and as a finance, a climate finance person, it's not just scale but also doing no unintentional harm which also keeps away a lot of people away from getting in the middle of situations. So, it seems like you are looking to address that. Yes, of course. See, in a… in a rural landscape anywhere in the world, we've uh, worked in Sierra Leone and uh, now we're looking at Suriname and Guyana apart from India. Without earning a farm level trust that people should trust you, Without that, just finance and technology is not going to produce results. Human contact is needed. Without this, you try to do anything, it'll end up in disasters and conflicts at the local level. So, only those who are willing to be committed, because it's a lifetime of work, it's not something that you can do with three days of uh, going there and doing some campaign, it need… people need to see that. But putting money in front of our words will bring more trust in them. They know we are not coming here to take something, we are coming here to offer something. So what I'm talking about is, if we build this possibility of creating the power of scale for the farmer, which is what is missing right now. Government action is there, we, we have changed a few government policies right now in southern states, in some of the southern states at least, we've got hundred and twenty-five rupee a subsidy for every tree that the farmer grows. We have geocoded it, it is being measured uh, regularly. According to the growth, the subsidy keeps coming to them year on year straight to their bank account. Because of digitization, there is no in-between middlemen and all this stuff, it's happening. So people have trust. Now the problem is, there used to be a problem, if you plant a tree in your own land and cut it tomorrow when it grows for your need, if you cut it, they will arrest you. Activists will come and get off, uh, you know, surround your house and shout slogans against you. So nobody wants to plant a tree. So now we've changed that law, 
that most of the species except a few, we are trying to get that also released. High value trees must be planted by the farmer, he should be able to benefit from that. Right now we are invent... Uh, we are importing billions of dollars worth of timber from outside, but we don't let our farmers grow it and we are trying to protect the forest. This is rubbish, how can you protect the forest when there is so much demand for timber, unless you can grow it on your own land? So these laws, the changes and the comprehensive way of looking at it, we are doing it with central government. But most of these are concurrent issues, we have to again, after working with the central government, convincing them, passing the law, then we have to go down and work with twenty-eight different states. It's a laborious thing. So I'm saying, in this, let's say out of these twenty-eight states, if five to six states, we create farmer consor consortiums like this, which has ten to twenty-five thousand farmers as modules and show the economic prosperity that it can bring to them, in a matter of four to five years, we can demonstrate this. If this happens, rest of the people will take it up by themselves. There is no better preaching than success. When they see success, they'll go for it. So switching gears and Rafalda, starting with you, um, currently sustainable ag is being looked at as a carbon sequestration play um, by a lot of people who are paying attention to it and you both know the value of sustainable ag not just in terms of nutrition as you pointed out but also biodiversity, water and so many other issues. What can be done to make sure that the policy makers and all the other bilateral institutions that are working in it take into account all the attributes of sustainable agriculture? Well, we need to keep talking about it and bring it to this type of uh, fora. Um, it is, I mean, it is, it is uh, true that uh, we, we know uh, soil sequesters carbon. Um, I mean, the, 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 I think there's still quite a bit of uh, uncertainty and there have been studies around how much and, and the different types of soils and how does that uh, change. Um, and and of course you know um, there's there are quite a quite a lot of big hopes out there uh, from uh, many and this not applies just to forests but applies to uh, to soil it applies to forests um, that um, if if one can quantify this and 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 issue some certificates um, they might uh, so the argument is that. The, the farmers or th those that uh, have these trees and these forests might be actually able to benefit from, from, from the markets because somebody is willing to pay to have this because they have to offset elsewhere. Um, but, um, but so, so, and this is discussed here and it's, you know, it's a big debate about the role of carbon markets. Um, but um, the critical thing is, you know, we can't we can't look at these issues in in this compartmentalized way, um, because again, we can continue to uh, practice or use old what we have been doing, and we would be storing carbon probably less and less so. Um, but we are perpetuating practices that we know will drive food insecurity and will deplete the water tables and it will jeopardize the livelihoods. So, so that's, that's what we need to do, is to um, work with all of the willing <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, and, and keep raising awareness and, and bringing it to the... I mean, we are not alone, there are many. Uh, and, Sadhguru has a, a, a mega pl platform, uh, <laughs> uh, so him and, and, and many others, which is how I think need to keep raising that awareness. Uh, talking about uh, putting our money where it matters, I feel where it matters most is it must go to people who are on the land, because they are the ones who can make difference, but not as subsidies but as incentives to do the right action. Right now subsidies are just asking them to sit back and get the subsidy, which is the worst thing to do 
give any man money without expecting any activity or work or productivity, that's the worst thing you can do to human societies <laughs> In every way you will destroy the fabric of a society by doling out money to people who don't do anything. So, for example, right now these governments, one or two state governments are giving this subsidy of hundred and twenty-five rupees over four years, growth-based, for a tree is being watched and as it grows they'll get subsidy. Now we are trying to create a timber market for them where they can digitally sell their tree when it's four to five years of age, but sold and cut after twenty years. But every year they start paying them looking at the growth. All the farmer has to do is take a picture of the tree and say, this tree is in this condition. Each one of them are marked and geocoded. So now the companies start paying them. But the most important thing is right now it's costing us about 2.5 dollars per tree, including the subsidy for four years, cultivating the tea tree. This is not just tree, tree cultivation, this is tree-based agriculture. In between we are even growing paddy and every other crop, it is done in such a way that the tree's foliage is used as a way of replenishing the land. So if we do this, it's 2.5 dollars per tree. Right now we are committed to plant 2.42 billion trees in the Kaveri Basin which accounts for 83 to 84 thousand square kilometers of land. But if we can, let's say, take 12 to 13 or 15 river basins like this, which will amount to nearly 70 percent of India's land, we will have to plant something like 40 to 50 billion trees, which we can easily fulfill if the necessary finances there for this. See, these things will not happen unless we create an emotional movement with the people. And there is a financial incentive that if they do this, they will get money for sure. And this is a sure way of arresting migration. When there is trees on the tree, on the land, they will not leave that land and go away to the city because they know today one… one reasonably hardwood tree, if it becomes about eighteen inches diameter in India, it is worth about three lakhs, which is unheard of money for them. Um, to give you a perspective, an average good land, I'm saying if they're growing sugarcane, they're getting fifteen to twenty thousand rupees per year. So, three hundred thousand rupees is how many years to earn that? Fifteen years to earn that. But here it's growing, not occupying the whole land, just in parts of the land it is growing. So, this is an enormous wealth. But they did not plant it. Earlier there used to be tree plantation, it was very much part of our tradition. If… Uh, if a girl is born in ho at home, if a child is born, five trees everybody used to plant. If a boy is born, ten trees. Now don't think this is gender discrimination, I'll tell you why. Because a girl is born, by the time she's eighteen, she gets married and then she's somebody else's problem. <laughs> if a boy is born, it's a lifelong problem for you, so you need ten trees. <laughs> So this culture used to be there, but they stopped planting trees because this activism and loss came in such a way, the tree that you have planted, you can't use it for your own purpose. Once that happened, people stopped planting trees. And also the chemical fertilizer companies, I know this, I've personally witnessed this when I was living on farms. These uh, chemical fertilizer manager, you know, like uh, sales managers coming and giving lectures in the village, if there are trees in your land, it will take away all the fertilizer. First thing is remove the trees. Millions of trees vanished from that area because they thought it's going to suck all the fertilizer. <laughs> it was fertilizing the land, nobody told them that. That was my example of the Ivory But there's a huge arbitrage opportunity because most of the companies we all have come across here, they're all pricing carbon at hundred dollars a ton. I think you are pricing it at a much lower amount, so there's an arbitrage opportunity. R right now they are saying, uh, if you look at the carbon credit thing per tree, the minimum you could get is about twelve hundred rupees. If you offer that to the farmer, I'll tell you, I'll have the whole damn country planted <laughs> Yes. One last question from my side before turning to the audience for any questions. Um, given where we are, um, anything that you would like, in addition to everything that we have heard in the last few days, um, anything that you would like the world leaders to agree upon 
um, and come together to do and, if, and, and why? See, uh, when it comes to energy, energy consumption is there, all of us are consuming energy. Nobody can claim that you are consuming more than me, that's not the point. The point is all of us are consuming energy, all of us are breathing, all of us are eating. So we are all consuming, but we are all not willing to compensate. So this is at the people level. People level movements are a different thing. But at the level of companies, at the level of governments, there is something to be done. When I say something to be done, see, there are developing nations and developing… developed nations and yet to become developing nations, all right? People who have basic, basic stuff. I see there is more willingness in the poorer nations and in the developing nations because they still don't have a life to… lifestyle to sacrifice. Their life is already sacrificed. They have, don't have a lifestyle to sacrifice, so if you tell them instead of this, you use this, they're willing. It's only the developed nations where they have a lifestyle, lifestyle to sacrifice, where they're unwilling to change anything. So this is something that needs to be addressed. At, the, at their own government level, see, the, I'm not here to point out, oh, you're living better than me, so you must pay. I'm not of that mentality, it's fine. You know, disparities have happened in the world, it's okay. But we are talking about a correction. What kind of correction will make maximum difference? That is what we must aim at. So if you have to aim at, we are going at alternate uh, energy systems. But these are all time-consuming things, it won't happen overnight. But bringing in cultures of, you know, today young people are generally moving in that direction, many of them don't care to own a car, they just don't mind going by Uber or a train or a bus. It's good, but will the governments build substantial mass transportation? That's an important thing. And bringing these changes at the industrial level is far easier than to bring it at the consumer level. Consumer level is visible. It, it can be, you know, pandered as a great achievement. But at the industrial level, with a simple rule, you can just change that. That needs to happen where the big consumption is, how we build our industries, how we build our mega… Even I'm saying uh, the military vessels that are going around, transportation vessels that are going around, you must aim at that because that can be easily transformed. But transforming everybody's life and saying you sacrifice some part of your lifestyle, world will change, this will be lot of jargon and not much change on the ground. I've seen lot of people who drive a Tesla to the office, but they have a beast at home to drive on the weekend <laughs> Walter, would you like to add anything? And, and we… because we were talking about finance and big fi finance gaps uh, in support of you know, Global South developing countries, which is one of the big topics of… of this conference, perennial discussions. Um, I think it's about time and, and hopefully, I'm not expecting it to be resolved in one of the, in this COP, I'm not even sure that it will be resolved in a COP, but, uh, or, or some other forum, but, um, and the UN Secretary General keeps, you know, calling this out, even this morning he was calling it again. There, there are ways of, you know, using we need to think about the, f the fiscal instruments that can be used, raising tax um, on aviation or shipping or, or fossil fuel company uh, windfall and profits um, or, you know, I, you know, one of the things I lived for many years uh, in, in the U.S. and it was interesting to see that several millionaires and billionaires saying, we want to be taxed more. Um, it's just who, that we… Who, who are these guys? <laughs> I never met them. <laughs> Warren Buffett, I think, except for him. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> but I think… Um, I, I think it's about time that uh, we… that the leaders find the right place and forum uh, because… And, and they can do it in a way that we are not taxing the poor. Uh, but if you raise the taxes for the corporations, they will tax the poor. Well, they have to avoid I, that. I'm saying inevitably it'll come down to the consumer, isn't it? Whatever you put on the companies, they will 
bring it to the consumer. So one example that uh, is talked about is taxing or we might not call it even a tax because it might it's just taxing for example flights. flights. A small flights. Tax increase the price of any f flight ticket by X amount, the international ones and the business class ones even more, the first class ones even more. And of course people would still need to figure out how do we actually collect these resources, who's collecting and then how they are distributed. Um, but this type, and these are just some of the ideas, there are other ideas out there, but it's, um, these are possibilities of really then not impacting because for, you know, already it would be the consumer paying, <laughs> but it would be the, 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 the better of consumers that <laughs> would be paying. Also, uh, I know this may sound impractical right now, but we must move in this direction. That the amount of money that's being spent uh, on arms and armaments, if you tax every bullet a little bit, tiny little bit, one percent, that one percent would amount to significant amount and that could go into climate action. When I say climate action, once again, if you fire one bullet less, maybe one life is saved and also the amount of climate, the <laughs> damage it is doing, a single bullet is quite a lot. So, uh, will governments do this? Because people have not said we want it, that is what I'm saying. See, when governments are elected for a period of four years in most of the world, in India it's five years, it means that you have a job, you are at the peak or at the top for just four years. In case you lose the election, you just gone, you're in the dumps. If this is the kind of job you have, what will you do? You will try to do something that works in four years. Climate action is not that one. So something that produces results in ten, fifteen, twenty years' time, who will do that? Only when people assure or people make a statement that if you do this to ensure the future of our nation and our children, we are with you, when people, sixty percent of the electorate says that clearly, that is when administrations will act. This is the fundamentals of democracy. We are all wanting democracy but people are not yet participating. This is why these mass movements of trying to move four billion people, all this stuff is, if sixty percent of any electorate clearly states we are concerned about the soil, what about our children, what are you doing for them? If you don't do this, we will not elect you. This will become the electoral issue. Once it's the electoral issue, it's action. I, now I'm going to <laughs> take the opportunity because Sadhguru and I was at, were actually talking about this before uh, we came here and I, I, I agree, I couldn't agree more with him. We, we need to have people demanding action from governments. But how do we get there, Sadhguru? See, it's for getting there, we need to show success stories. This is why I'm saying ten thousand, twenty-five thousand farmers come together and make a big success story. We can blast it around the world. Today, getting to the people is not difficult. Never before this was possible. We can sit here and talk to the entire world. This was not possible any time in history of humanity. It's possible now. We can use a whole bunch of influences, which is what we did in the Safe Soil Movement. Once people who have five million, ten million, hundred million following, all of them start voicing the same thing, it's all across. It's not difficult to do this. We can do this. The means are there. Will we do it or not is the only question. But we need to show a success story, here is it. We can… we can create a farm of twenty-five thousand farmers, they don't have to aggregate the land. Only aggregation of, you know, a focus in terms of marketing and uh, procurement and they show a success story how as a community they came together and made it happen. There's a great story in India called the Banas Dairy, which is producing the Amul products. I don't know if you've heard of Amul, no. It's a… it's a great success story. So it was one man's vision and he created this and today they're very successful. But what has happened is that as a dairy farm, it is the most successful cooperative movement in the world. But their land has degraded. So now we a Save Soil is working with their land. The problem here is here there is organization and they have the money, they can do it. 
But the problem is, it's a very salt-rich land. Turning this is around is going to take eight to twelve years. But if, let's say we do the same thing in southern India, in a matter of two years we'll turn it around because it's rich land, gone bad. We can easily put back the organic content and do that. So these kind of moments are there, but they are very uni-focused, that is only dairy product. But if you make it into a big successful produce and also document how energy consumption has come down, because right now, as I said, every hectare has a bore well, electricity, all these wires running all over the place, we can easily have for every hundred year, hundred uh, acres, there could be one water source and make it into integrated watering, you know, irrigation system. We can show how it is making a difference in terms of less consumption of fuel and how many human hands have become free to do something else with their time and how the life of health and life of women is very important because right now women are pregnant, they are not eating the right food to produce a healthy child. They are eating miserably. Then you produce a miserable child. When you produce a miserable child, how will you have a wonderful world? It's not going to happen. I'm saying we're not taking care of the fundamentals. Why always in many societies across the world, women have been looked at in a certain way is because she is the basis of next generation. How she is, is how the next generation happens. It's always good to end a panel with a constructive or a positive um, summary of your thoughts. So Mafalda, maybe we can start with you. Um, any closing thoughts? No, I, I think uh, just picking up on this last exchange with Sadhguru, uh, I would like to thank you um, personally and, uh, and all of your million of volunteers for the work uh, you do and for, for this campaign and other campaigns. Uh, and more, more importantly, for, for your mission in raising consciousness. Um, um, and, but you know, I think it's upon all of us to use our networks and our platforms, whatever small or large they are, to really call for action. Um, this is this is really what the world needs right now. Thank you, Sadhguru. Call for action is very important. It's very vital, vitally important, and the necessary fund for action, if it comes from non-governmental sources, it's best because. Governments have certain systems which by the time you lubricate it into action, you'll be done, your life may be over. I'm not trying to be negative, I've worked. I've worked for over forty years in this and I know to get one small thing, how much of my life goes waste. To get this subsidy, hundred and twenty-five rupees subsidy in one government, one state government, Seven to eight years of my life and uh, the people you are calling as volunteers, they're all slaves, unpaid slaves, all right? And uh, their lives are gone, seven to eight years running from pillar to post, pillar to post, because just to make every man understand on the way. If somebody has the necessary compassion in their hearts and a little bit of understanding in their head, using them and their funds, if you can make it happen, at least the large-scale modules, samples, if you make it happen, let… rest of it, let the governments do. Thank you. Um, thank you for thank letting you. me moderate the <laughs> panel. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. <laughs>